Okay, so some topics in physics are uh, easy enough that a simple video lecture is sufficient to uh, cover uh, the concepts and be able to illustrate various uh, ideas uh, quite easily without the student and teacher together. Uh, other ones require a little bit back and forth uh, discussion in order for uh, true learning to take place. This one I fear is a little bit more of the latter type. Um, velocity dependent forces, drag and terminal velocity is a little bit complicated. Um, I'm going to do my best to explain it uh, on a video. Um, I'm going to ask you occasionally to uh, pause the video and consider some questions that I would normally ask in class and then uh, pause the video, come back uh, and see if your reasoning is correct. So let's see if we can do this. Uh, when an object moves through a fluid, it experiences a drag force that is uh, that depends on how fast the object is moving. If the uh, velocities are small, uh, and again that's a relative term, uh, the force is approximately proportional to the velocity. If it's higher speeds, uh, then the force is approximately proportional to the square of the velocity. So it's not, uh, uh, these are no longer going to be very simple cases. We have some forces that are changing as time goes on. So all of the stuff that we've been looking at, all of F equals M times A, and uh, we have some work energy principles, all of those sort of relying on uh, constant forces, or if they were non-constant uh, forces, if they were perhaps variable forces, we were able to write those functions, uh, maybe a force as a function of x, or a force as a function of time, um, and we could use some of those tools. Here, it gets a little bit harder, and you'll see why as we progress through uh, this lesson. If the drag force on a falling object is proportional to its velocity, the object will gradually slow until the drag force and the gravitational force are equal, uh, then it falls with a constant velocity, which we call the terminal velocity. Now, to help understand that, I'm going to show a little vi visual here. So I think I have, uh, yep, there we go. Um, I have a video uh, uh, or uh, um, simulation uh, available from physics uh, classroom. And uh, let's see, let's change this thing to, looks like a, a jello container or something like that. Let's lift this object all the way up to about 490 meters and just let it go. And you can see the... Uh, uh, let's get rid of the parachute for the time being. Uh, you can see that the um, the uh, cup of Play-Doh or whatever that is uh, falls. Initially, it uh, it accelerates at that rate of 9.8 meters per second per second, but very quickly uh, it slows its rate of acceleration and uh, eventually reaching the top end speed of about 10 meters per second. Uh, that top end speed occurs when the drag force, 20 newtons, is equal to the weight. So no longer is the object accelerating. Now, a lot of times people say, well, heavier objects fall faster, and that is true in the presence of air resistance. If I have a heavier block there, so 200 newtons instead of 20, um, the object's gonna have to travel quite a bit faster until the drag force, which is dependent on how fast it's going, is equal then to the weight. Here, it's got a terminal velocity closer to about 31.6 meters per second. Now, when I throw a parachute on there, what a parachute does is it uh, greatly increases the surface area. So the drag force, still 200 newtons, is now occurring uh, at a much slower overall velocity. So that's how parachutes actually allow us to hit that ground a little bit more safely. Now that should help you understand um, some of the, uh, the topics that we're going to now discuss. When we consider an FBD uh, for an object falling in the presence of a uh, variable force, a force that depends on how fast it's going, we might draw an FBD that looks something like this. We're saying drag force is equal to negative BV. The negative because it's opposite the direction of the weight. The B there is what's called a drag coefficient. It's a, a number that's sort of indicating sort of the, uh, the shape of the object. It has to do with its surface area, has to do with its shape, whether or not it's spherical or teardrop shape or conical. Um, and so that value B is sort of an experimental value. Um, and uh, it helps us determine like how fast an object might travel uh, prior to it reaching terminal velocity. Now, if I wanted to find the actual value for V sub T, uh, I would set these two equal to each other because when it finally reaches its terminal velocity, these two forces are in fact equal. So the weight force and the drag force, uh, let's say I'm gonna put that down as negative BV, and mg, that's uh, going to be equal at some terminal velocity. I'm going to go ahead and use the magnitude of that. So b, v ten, uh, v terminal velocity is equal to mg, and so the terminal velocity can be uh, found as just mg, the weight divided by b. Now, it's important to remember that this particular analysis that we're looking at is when the drag force is proportional to the velocity. It becomes quite a bit more challenging to consider when the drag force is proportional to the square of the velocity, but nonetheless, we should be able to understand uh, most of the physics by looking at this example. So, terminal velocity, mg over b.
Now if we look at this velocity time graph down here, we see uh, the velocity uh, initially increases at a rapid rate, as a matter of fact. Initially, it would accelerate. We think of the instantaneous rate of change of that, the acceleration, the slope there, would be uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. But as the drag force becomes larger, getting to be a, a much closer uh, proportion of the overall weight, we would see that the instantaneous rate of acceleration is decreasing until eventually we get to zero acceleration, the terminal velocity Vt mg over b. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, extend this lecture to show you how we might determine the velocity as a function of time. So eventually it will get to terminal velocity. I would like to know how to describe uh, that velocity at any point in time uh, while it's accelerating at a variable rate. So I'm going to do that on another slide here. So let's go ahead and do that with another slide. Okay, so here I have a blank screen, uh, and hopefully I think I left one of these in your packet. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, draw a series of FBDs over here. So here's an object uh, initially starting out. Acceleration is equal to the acceleration due to gravity, so it just came out of the airplane, if you will. Uh, and so the only force acting on it is mg. And then later on, uh, we're going to get to the point where acceleration is equal to zero, where it's now moving at a terminal velocity, which it would be mg over b. What I'm going to ask you to do is uh, to draw the FBD uh, for uh, this object at two uh, or three other places along this motion. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can't draw the FBD uh, for the object at these three other spots. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to try that. Uh, you should see that the weight force at each one of these locations would still be the same. The weight would always be mg here. So always has the same downward force. But the upward force is becoming uh, bigger. So the faster it's traveling, initially we have this negative bv, and then later on it's a little bit bigger, negative bv, and then eventually we get to that terminal velocity where negative bv, or bv rather, is equal to uh, mg. So that should be the FBD for it. Now, if we consider A is equal to G here, we would see that uh, A is actually less than G here. A is much less than G here, and then eventually A goes to zero. Now, I want to be able to describe the velocity as a function of time. To do that, I'm of course going to use Newton's second law. So I want to uh, go ahead and write Newton's second law this way. Uh, the acceleration the object experiences is equal to the net force divided by the mass. The net force is changing. It's not just the weight of the object. That net force would be mg, and then I'm going to say it's equal to, m uh, and then mg minus bv, where b again is that drag coefficient. Velocity uh, is going to be changing as it's moving, so this term is no longer constant all over m. Something that I might do here then is to recognize that I could cancel out that m with this m, but I can't cancel out an m here. So when I go to write a, I might write it as g minus bv over m, and that's certainly allowed to do. Now it cleans it up a little bit. It helps us see that if the drag coefficient is zero, or if there's no air resistance there, the acceleration would in fact be equal to g. And then um, if we were to consider uh, the point at which uh, bv over m is equal to g, we would see that's where the acceleration uh, goes to zero. Okay, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this equation and uh, try to solve this or try to determine uh, a, a way of finding the velocity as a function of time. Uh, this can be quite challenging, so I'm going to pause the video from time to time and ask you to sort of consider some questions. Let's go ahead and uh, rewrite A as the instantaneous rate of change in velocity. And now that I have uh, sort of a, uh, an equation that involves uh, a derivative, I'm going to go ahead and try to combine some terms. So anything that's related to velocities, I'm going to have on the left-hand side. Uh, anything related to uh, times, I'm going to have on the right-hand side. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause this video uh, and ask you to rearrange this equation to see if you can't collect your terms. So get anything related to velocities on the left-hand side, anything related to time on the right-hand side. And what we do with those constants, we'll see if you and I agree on what to do with those. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can rearrange that.
Okay, and so now hopefully you've had a chance to do that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by dt and then divide both sides by this entire uh, thing here to get this uh, kind of equation. So dv all over g minus bv over m would be equal to dt. So that would be my first step. Now I look at this and I say, well, I'm going to try to come up with velocity as a function of time. I'm clearly going to have to do some integration here. Uh, in order for me to integrate uh, this equation, I might look for um, some uh, some things that I know how to integrate. So sort of look at some parent functions. And so I'm going to give one of these to you here, uh, that the derivative of the natural log of x with respect to x, so d dx of that function is equal to 1 over x. And if I were to take the integral of 1 over x dx, that would be the natural log of x. Okay, so something that looks like that. Now, I see when I look at this equation, it sort of looks like it's similar to that natural log uh, function, that I have a dv compared to a dx, and I have that v portion down in the denominator. That's where I have that x here. So it looks very similar to this. I'm going to go ahead and try to rewrite this equation or sort of manipulate it so that it gets into a form that's easily integratable. So what I'm going to do now, uh, you could pause the video if you'd like and try to do this math on your own, uh, or you could sort of watch me go through this here. Uh, so if you want to pause it, go ahead. If not, I'm going to go ahead and progress right through this. I'm going to start by multiplying uh, this uh, fraction on the left-hand side by a negative m over b all over a negative m over b, and you'll see why here in a moment. Um, that's going to get my v term all by itself. So instead of having some constants out in front of it, I'm going to go ahead and try to isolate v, get v all by itself. So this becomes now, the numerator would be a, a negative m over b times dv. The denominator, I'm going to put this term first. Uh, let's see, when I multiply that out, I get v, and then when I multiply this, I get negative mg over b, and that's of course equal to dt. Okay, now my next step, uh, I'm going to try to get dv all by itself. I see I have just a dx in the numerator here. I have this negative m over b uh, times dv, so I'm going to then uh, move this negative m over b over to the other side so that I get something that looks like this, dv all over v minus mg over b is equal to a negative b over m dt. Okay, so I sort of clean that up. I got something that looks pretty similar to this now. Instead of dx, I got dv, and instead of x, I have v minus mg over b. These are just constants, and so when I go to do this integration, it's not going to be just the natural log of x. It's going to end up being the natural log of v minus mg over b. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, do that formally by writing that here. I'm going to end up integrating both sides. Let's put some limits on our integration. Uh, we're going to start our velocity at zero, and it's going to eventually get to some final velocity v. It would end up being our terminal velocity that we'll see uh, later on. Uh, we're going to uh, integrate this from zero to some eventual time. Uh, so those are going to be our limits of our integration. Let's go ahead and now use the fact that we did all that math to get it into a form that's easily integratable. Uh, this left-hand side would just simply be the natural log of v minus mg over b, and that's evaluated from 0 to v. The right-hand side, uh, that negative b over m is a constant, so when I integrate dt, I just get t, so there'd be a negative b over m t, and that's evaluated from 0 to t. The left-hand side, let's go ahead and plug a v in here, so we get a neg natural log of v minus mg over b, minus, now i got to plug in a 0, and so that'd be minus the natural log, of 0 minus this, and uh, that would be equal to a negative b over m. When I plug in a t here, I get t. Plug in a 0, I get 0. So that's what that equation looks like. Now I've got a difference between logarithms. I can go ahead and clean that up by using sort of a qu quotient rule, if you will. 
And so uh, this would be the natural log of V minus mg over B all over negative mg over B. And that would be equal to uh, negative B over mt. Now I can go ahead and solve this. Uh, v minus mg over b all over negative mg over b is equal to e to the negative b over mt. Let's clean that up a little bit further. Running out of room. Let's raise this up. Uh, v minus mg over b is equal to a negative mg over b e to the negative b over m t boy this is getting to be a mess uh, add m g over b to both sides v would be equal to m g over b uh, minus m g over b e to the negative b over m t and one last step v as a as a function of time pull out this m g over b 1 minus e to the negative b over m times t. Quite a bit of work to get to that uh, expression for velocity as a function of time, but uh, that's how we would go ahead and do that. So it involves some integral calculus uh, because of that uh, variable uh, force of air resistance. Now, uh, let's evaluate uh, this equation. We just went through a lot of math, a lot of physics, to sort of derive this equation, it's oftentimes useful to evaluate it for some extremes. We've talked about that quite a few times whenever we derive complicated equations to see if it makes sense for some things that we would, uh, that we know to be true. Let's first consider when time is zero. When time is zero, we should see that we, this equation should show us that the velocity is zero. So it's starting from a state of rest, um, and I want to get to um, to see that this equation satisfies velocity is equal to zero at t equals zero. So t equals zero. Uh, this term, e to the 0, would be 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. This equation would, uh, would show that the initial velocity is, in fact, 0. Now, as time goes on and gets bigger and bigger and big bigger, eventually this term is going to end up going, so the e to the negative b over m times t, that would be the same as 1 over e to some number that's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's going to end up, this term would end up going to 0 then. So 1 minus 0 would be 1. We'd see that the velocity way down the road would be equal to mg over b. That would be that terminal velocity, the thing that we looked at right here. And so that equation seems to satisfy uh, our requirements, at least for those two extremes. Now something else that we might want to do is to graph this function to see how uh, the velocity does change with time, see if it actually corresponds with something that looks like this. Again, velocity is a function of time. We saw something that looks like this here, where the velocity will increase at a high rate in the beginning, but then slowly get to the point where the uh, velocity will no longer increase, terminal velocity, something along those lines. Let's go ahead and take a look at that on Desmos. I believe I have a Desmos screen pulled up. I do. Looks like that here. Hopefully you have, uh, you can see all of these things here. So here's my mg over b times 1 minus e to the negative b over m. I'm using x as my variable there and y as my variable there. I do have to define some values of mg and b. Let's give me a mass of, let's call it, let's just give it a 5 kilogram mass. Uh, let's do this on Earth. Uh, 9.8 meters per second per second. And uh, let's give a B value. I'm not quite sure what I might use for B, but let's just call it 1 to begin with. So sure enough, that equation, uh, that graph sort of looks like we expected. Let me zoom in just a little bit here. Um, the velocity increases. It has some terminal velocity of around 49 meters per second. And it uh, increases pretty quickly in the beginning. But then as the force of air resistance gets bigger, its rate of acceleration changes. And it uh, looks pretty good. I would say it takes almost 30 seconds for it to get really close to its terminal velocity. Let's go ahead and uh, change this. If it's, a, if it's a lighter object, so instead of 5 uh, kilograms, let's say it's uh, 2 kilograms, we can see that uh, that does affect the terminal velocity. It's going to be traveling at a slower rate, almost uh, 19 and a half uh, meters per second. And uh, it gets there uh, a little bit quicker, so around 10 seconds, somewhere in that area. Uh, let's see, if uh, I have a uh, higher drag coefficient, um, you can see that that decreases the 
terminal velocity as well. And so it'd be something that has like a really large surface area, something along those lines. If it's something like teardrop shape or something along those lines that has a really low coefficient, uh, drag coefficient, we would see that the terminal velocity would end up being higher. So there we go. A couple of, uh, couple of interesting ideas related to uh, non-constant uh, forces, how we might use uh, some integral calculus to uh, determine a velocity as a function of time.